Welcome back, Chronics. I have a surprise for you. We can do yoga. Turns out, if we just get to know our bodies, we can do the same stuff normal people can do. With adjustments, obviously. But how exciting is this? I talked to fellow zebra, physical therapist, and yogi, Libby Hinsley, who wrote a book called Yoga for Bendy People. Hope you guys enjoy the interview and I will put a link to her book in the episode description. Thank you so much for talking to me. I so appreciate it. I love your book. I'm um, so glad. It's so funny because when I, I wasn't diagnosed with EDS till I was 32. Mm -hmm. And the rheumatologist I went to, like the first thing I said, I was like, I've tried yoga and it just seems to make things worse. He was this big Russian guy and he said, he was like, why would you do yoga with joints like that? And I was like, I didn't <laughs> know I had joints like this, you know? So then I was like, oh my God, like I can still do yoga. I just have to adjust things. Cool. Well, you know, I didn't get diagnosed with EDS until I was, I was probably 43. I mean, it was just a few years ago. So, you know, and I've have had symptoms my whole life. So isn't it validating? It is. It was surprisingly so for me. Yes, me too. It's, it's just really bizarre stuff. But once it makes sense, it's like it finally makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to get this information out to as many people as I can. I mean, I know everybody, you know, has a channel, but I figured I'd participate because there's just still so much knowledge that needs to be shared with doctors, practitioners, everybody. Um, yes. So yeah. I feel like the more we talk about it, uh, the more people will understand why they are the way that they are. Yeah. We want to talk about kind of why, why sort of normal yoga practice may not yeah. go well, basically for, right. for bendy people. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to say, first we have to say, well, what do we mean by yoga? You know, cause it's just, it means something different for everyone and that's the trouble. And if we just base our concept of yoga on a lot of the media images that we see, then we're really not getting it. We're just right. we're mis misled to believe that yoga has to do with performing these pretzel-like shapes as though that is some goal in and of itself. And it's just totally not. Yeah. So we can't really talk about this question without talking about the <clears throat> the misrepresentation of yoga in modern Western culture, basically, yes. and in the media, um, because that's the type of yoga, yoga as performance, like asana, the postures as performance, that is where we're going to get into injury zone. If yeah. we just threw that out and we just said, hey, we're moving our bodies mindfully. We're paying attention to how they feel. We're using asana as a tool to help us study ourselves, develop a, a relationship with ourselves, and to go somewhere deeper. It's not about the asana. It's about where it takes us. Then we would be way less um, at risk for injury. But, you know, given, given that a lot of people approach yoga as this sometimes fast paced asana practice that's often in a heated room, very mm -hmm. acrobatic, um, very much, you know, you're encouraged to go deeper and to find your next edge and all these different things going on. That is a setting where the person with hypermobility um, is more likely to get injured. They're not necessarily going to get injured. They're most likely going to have kind of sprains or strains. Worst case scenario, they're going to have joint dislocations, especially their shoulder. That's what's going to dislocate in a yoga class. It's going to dislocate at end range, right. you know, and right. they're going to have, and because they have different connective tissue, let's think of it as a connective tissue difference. That basically means the col collagenous materials in the ligaments, the tendons, the joint capsules, the fascia, they're not as taut. They're not as strong and sturdy. And so they give more, they yield more, and they allow more movement to occur. And they're just, they are, I don't want to say they're more fragile, except that they are more fragile. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They are. It's 100% and, but they're, true. they're also adaptable. We just have to be kind of careful with them as we encourage them to adapt. So they just are at more risk of injury. You know, if you think about what happens to connective tissue when you pull on it, you stretch it, mm -hmm. it will change shape slowly after more time. Like you mentioned, kind of you've liked doing the static 
kind of end range, long hold static poses, kind of what you would find in a yin yoga class mm -hmm. that um, will stimulate the connective tissue to deform or change shape or to spread out. And it takes three to five minutes. You know, some people argue even more mm -hmm. to have that deformation happen. Well, yeah. in a bendy person, it happens more quickly. It's like, in, and that's called tissue creep. And tissue creep and it feels like almost it's like that like lactic acid buildup feeling kind of mm -hmm. is that what it kind of like feels like like a burning like when your thighs start to burn when you're yeah it can it can have all kinds of different you know sensations associated with it which are really just sensations of tension and when we tension connective tissue we're also tensioning muscle tissue as well they're not we can't separate those out but the thing is that it just, it creeps more easily. I say that bendy people's tissues are just more creepy. They're yep, it's so true. They it's are. So and then, and they'll come back. They'll, it's what's called recoil, but they come back more slowly, yes. more slowly. And so in the interim, like, especially in that immediate zone, after we do like a prolonged passive stretch, mm -hmm. we actually have less stability because we have even less passive support than we had before. And in that absence of less passive stability we have um a harder time with neuromuscular control so it really we really are at more risk for injury yeah i find myself when i say like a prolonged stretch even if i'm sitting on the couch in like you know my position where my legs are up and you know and i'll be sit like that for a while because it's comfortable but then when i go to move after it's like ow yes it's, it's not as I'm like, I can't, I have to remember, I can't put my legs up like that because they're not supposed to necessarily go up there, but I don't know my limits, yeah. what the normal limits are of, you know, range and whatnot. So I just have to be mindful too of just sitting on when I'm sitting in a chair at the computer or anything else. Um, yes. And you have to study that. That's one of the things you have to sort of learn over time because your body won't give you the signals in the moment. Right. So you have to learn, oh yeah, last time I sat like this for 20 minutes, it didn't go well afterwards. So I need to change what I'm doing now. And that's really the other, I think, maybe even the biggest reason why we're at more risk of injury is that we don't get the signals from our body about what's happening in the body. We don't get those, um, those mechanoreceptors, the little nerve endings that are sensing pressure and stretch and position. They just like, they're harder to stimulate. Mm -hmm. I think in part because our connective tissue is floppier and it it has to get under tension but before those things are stimulated. And then we get the messaging to our brain that says, what's going on in the body? Where are we? How do we feel? And those messages are just kind of delayed. They're inefficient. Um, and so we have trouble knowing how we're feeling in the what moment. Our, what our limits are, honestly. It's yes. so true because what feels good to us, don't ask my friends how they sit at home on the couch, like to know that, you know, it's different than how I sit on the couch. I'm looking at your stretches and I was like, wow, when I stretch my thigh, I am totally doing like this, like 90 degree angle with my leg. And I'm like, that is not what I'm supposed to do. Right. So this is good stuff to know. Now, yeah. I learn so many new things every day still cool. about Yes, that. yes, yes. And we can make changes in our practice that help our brain map our body more clearly um, and kind of help with our the, the maps of the body that live in the brain aren't as so there's the mechanical problem of we don't get stimulated as easily right. but there's also a brain anatomy difference that bendy people have a smaller real estate in their brain devoted to body mapping and so we can increase that and we can get some more signaling to the brain by increasing the tension in our stretch by making it more active Mm -hmm. So like instead of flopping into a stretch, we can contract the muscles a little bit that are stretching. That's going to limit our range, but it's also going to add sensory input to the brain. So the brain's going to be like, ooh, now I feel something cool. And this is still tension. I'm still feeling stretch. I'm just not waiting until I get to end range to feel it. I'm adding a little bit to it. I'm actually increasing the tension on the tissues, but before mid range, and now I can feel something at, you know, at a place that is less likely to be injurious. And now I get the benefit of um, not only feeling my body, but kind of helping my brain better understand my body over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's so important too, for so many people. I mean, just, I found out when was this, I think I was five years ago, I was literally just doing an arts and crafts project 
on the floor and I came down on the floor and sat wrong and I literally had trouble walking for two months. Yeah. People are like, how did you hurt your back? I'm like, I was putting Christmas balls on (laughs) one of those like pool noodles and gluing them on to like some like whatever Pinterest thing. And I was like, and I sat down wrong. Yes. Yes. But now I never sit down like that again. So good to know. Yes. Yeah. And it's just always that weird stuff that's happening to people with, with hypermobility syndromes. And it's like, it's stuff that doesn't actually make sense mechanically. Like that shouldn't happen, right? You should be able to just sit down and not have some weird thing happen. But I, I call it the, it's a constant game of whack-a-mole, you know, and this, yes. the bendy person is like constantly, they got something else popping up and they're dealing with that. And then another thing, and it's just, it's ongoing. And part of what I try to help people who have these syndromes kind of understand and, and to get some acceptance around is that we will always be playing whack-a-mole. That's right. not going to stop. Exactly. But the stronger we get and the better we understand ourselves and our uh, condition and our unique needs, um, the quicker we're going to s- smack them back down when they do pop up. Absolutely. And I just know from my own like experience when I have a tendency to get deconditioned, if I stop doing my exercises, it's like, you're starting over again, getting back into it. And, you know, I don't have motivation on most days to do exercises. Um, but I do know that they do help in the, in the long run. It's just get that instant gratification right afterwards. We see progress like a long time over time over time. It's true. And so we have to just commit to some consistency on that. And, but then after, you know, once you settle into that consistent training, you do start to see the results, but then when you fall out of it, it can be hard to get back into it because you've got to adjust again. There might be some more fatigue and we try to mitigate that as much as we can, you know, with dosing and frequency and all of that, but it's going to be an adjustment. But once your system recalibrates to it, then it's like, ah, I have yep. so much more energy. I have more capacity, you know, like some, a lot of the people I work with in a strength training class that I teach for bendy people called bendy and badass. That's awesome. Um, it's so That's fun. So great. That is such it's a so great fun. name. I know. Um, it's so fun. And I started it for pa- my patients, you know, clinically it's mostly, I treat people with EDS and HSD. And I was telling every single one of them, you need to do strength training. And they were like, but where? And I was like, I don't know. Oh, no. Yeah. That's a good question. And so um the the one trainer that I had worked with personally for a year and I was kind of her guinea pig and she was learning about hypermobility and um I needed help with recovery. I was overdoing it every time I went to the gym. Yes. But I felt great in the moment. Right. right. Sure, sure. And then for the next like four or five days, I'm just laid out with just whole body fatigue and soreness and just yep. kind of debilitating. And that's so common. Yes. Yeah. I get that guilt feeling like it's somehow my fault because I went over, but I yeah. think now that I, I have to learn what those boundaries are before I know Absolutely. that I'm going over them. You do. So, and it takes time to that, learn those boundaries. Yeah. And so that's why I started working with this trainer. She's fabulous. And I said, finally, after years, like we just need to teach a class and, and a bunch of people like me are coming and yeah. we need to implement these same sort of methods that have worked for me and just see how it goes. But I tell people who come, it's like, it may be four to six weeks before you even get to your baseline. Cause we're going to progress so slowly and you're going to study your response so closely where it may take weeks for you to even get to a place where you feel challenged but you can also recover because the question isn't what can we do in this, whether it's a yoga practice or a strength training session, it's not what can we do today is what can we do today and feel good tomorrow? Yes, absolutely. And build that is just that. person specific. We have to study it. Absolutely. You no. Know, and your system is, is wired up to sense threat in that situation. And that's appropriate. I mean, given the proprioceptive deficits that many of us have, you know, those signals, we need to learn to listen to them and say, hey, trainer, I've got a different body. I've got actually a different sensory system. I've got a whole different nervous system going on here and we have got to work with it or else things are not going to go well. Yeah. If we push if we push past the alarm system here, um, it's not going to go well. And we can also understand that this alarm system is a bit sensitive. It's a little overreactive, but that's how it is. And it has got to feel safe. And when it feels safe, it can chill a little bit, but pushing those edges just doesn't work out. And so, you know, it really is hard for 
like a trainer like that or a, a PT or a yoga teacher or whatever it is that's working with someone, they need to know this is just a different body and yeah. it needs and it is adaptable. It is resilient. Mm -hmm. It can learn. It just has to go slowly, it has to progress really slowly, and it has got to feel safe. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me. Of um, course. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Okay. Bye. Bye.